came out, I think, in worship a couple of weeks ago, and it, the Lord just hit me with it. Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to Jesus, and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. He did, she didn't even let him answer, did she? The Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Jesus says your name twice. It's like, it's a good indication he's about to say something to you. You are anxious and troubled about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. That word good sometimes gets translated as better. But when you go back to the Greek, there is no, there is no way that that's, that could be. It's like better is not an option. It's not better than something else. It's good. Every, anytime you see that word, it's in contrast with good and evil. It's not contrasted with good and something slightly less than good. It's contrasted with something good and something evil, something good and something wrong. And so when you're looking at this, you don't look at the person who's task-oriented and the per person who's people-oriented, because I've heard that taught before. This is not the person who's task-oriented and the per person who's people-oriented, okay? Get that out of your mind. Martha is not task-oriented. She's worried. Jesus is rebuking her here gently, very gently. Martha is a friend of Jesus, okay? Just like Lazarus, just like Mary. Friend, okay? And he's coming to her. He's saying, look, you are, you are troubled. You're anxious. Why? Mary has chosen the good portion, the part that's good. In all of your busyness and all the stuff, really, Martha, which is because you're so concerned about the appearances of things, you're concerned about how it looks on you. You're not as concerned necessarily about serving the other person as you are just about making sure that everybody looks back and goes, okay, she knows what she's doing. She's on top of things. But Mary, recognizing that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is in her midst, decides to do what? She sits herself down and says, I need you to teach me. So I'm here and I'm listening. The better part to listen. So many times we get preoccupied with serving, don't we? We get preoccupied with all the distractions and the, and the, the anxious thoughts that we have that surround us. And we forget that the comforter, the presence of God is always with us. And if we're willing, we can yield our heart, we can yield the members of our body to this calm, this peace, and have a posture of peace, a posture of calmness. And from that position, we can move wherever we need to, knowing that we're secure in him. Mary was secure in Jesus. The root of anxiety is really pride. The thing that gives birth to anxiety is fear, and the thing that gives birth to fear is pride. And as we go down through these things, anxiety, anger, approval, you're going to see they're all, they all are derivative of pride. Every sin in the entire universe that, we, that comes down to it is birthed out of pride. It comes down to me. It comes down to self. What does Jesus say about anxiety? Matthew chapter 6. Verse 25, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? We do that, don't we? We try to do that. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow they neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the, into the fire. How much more will he not clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let me give you two uh, stories <laughs> yesterday of anxiousness. And like I said, you sometimes can't stop the initial emotion, like your heart's beating out of your chest. You're like, ah, fear, you know. Like we were, on, we were driving home from uh, the Creeper Trail yesterday, which was amazing. It's awesome. Have anybody been down the Creeper Trail before? It's like literally a 17-mile down, just you just coast, man. It's great. And I had Jaden behind me, so I was super glad that we were coasting because <laughs> um, he was in my little, the little cubby thing that you have to tell. Um, we were on our way home, driving in our car, and all of a sudden, L.A.-style motorcycle, <laughs> like right, just, I mean, I was like, whoa, like just saw him out of the back mirror, and like I was, I was in the process of passing another vehicle, so this dude just went <laughs> right between us, and I have not seen that here. I guess it happens in L.A. I guess you're allowed to do that. Is that right? Like you're allowed to ride in the, between the lines? I don't know. But I guess apparently that guy is like, I'm just going to do whatever I want. And he's like going 140 miles an hour at least because he just blazed to us. We're already going. I don't know how fast I was going, but <laughs> I'm going to disclose that here. Hey, police officer, where is he? No. Um, but anyways, my heart was beating out of my chest. I was anxious right there for a second. And I was like, uh, all with him. Actually, you know what? We went through this whole list of things here. <laughs> Anxiety, anger, appro- all this stuff just starts like going through my body. And I'm like, okay, okay, well, message tomorrow, still waters. <sighs> you know, breathing. Calm down. Then this evening, or last, last night, I had the hardest time going to sleep. I was, I was laying in my bed, and my alarm clock, I've had my alarm clock for probably, I don't know, 15 years, maybe, more than that super long time that I've had this alarm clock, right? So it's nostalgic for me in some ways because I think I actually had it when I was in New York. So whatever, you can, I don't like to get new things. <laughs> so we, uh, this alarm clock has um, AM, FM radio, right? And, um, you know, I was like laying in my bed and uh, all of a sudden I set my alarm, everything was, everything was great. And then all of a sudden uh, I hear this like white noise static, like <laughs> And it's like, and I'm like, what is going on? You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, it's out of some kind of a scary movie. And it starts going off, and I'm like, what is happening? So I look at it, and I'm like, what? And I try to mess with it to fix it. And um, I'm not getting a new one, so I'm trying to, like, figure out what what is wrong with it. And uh, it happened, like, three more times. So I'm a little tired this morning. But... uh, (laughs) <laughs> that anxiety, that initial sense of fear, I think is a primal feeling. So it's not something that you're just going to whisk away like it's nothing. However, we have an opportunity whenever we do feel something like that to immediately turn to the Lord, even like the scripture says, with a request, like, God, help me, be with me. I don't want to be worried. I don't want to be anxious. So this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. Please help me. And it says the peace of God, the scripture says, will guard us. And I love that active nature. Jesus says, don't be worried about all this stuff. God takes care of the grass. He takes care of the birds. He's going to take care of you. And even though our lives here on earth are short, God is going to see fit that until the day you die, you're going to accomplish the purposes that he has for you. And so in a certain sense, if your days are numbered into heaven and God knows exactly when you're going to die, up until that point in time, you are invincible. And we should... Be so bold and live such a way that we know that when our time has come, we're going. And so why don't we just live for God now? That that rules out all anxiety, all fear, when you know where you're going and when you're going is in the hands of the Lord. Okay, point number two. Anxious thoughts stir up the waters. Anger definitely stirs up the water. And I know many of us at different times in our lives have struggled with anger. Some of us struggle more with anxiety. Some of us struggle more with anger. Some of us struggle more with approval. And you may find yourself on any one of these things kind of leaning on one or the other. James chapter 1, 19 and 20 says this. This you know, my beloved brethren, that everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For the anger of man does not achieve or produce or work into the righteousness of God. It's got no plan in the righteousness of God. In other words, if you are angry, it 
over an extended period of time, which it's not very difficult to see how anger over a prolonged period of time has become sinful. That anger does not produce, does not achieve the righteousness of God. God is slow to anger, is he not? The Bible says that he is slow to anger and abounding in love. Slow to become angry. And there's a difference, I think, here between righteous indignation, which is that um, that's outside of your ego, which is a rare anger, rare anger, to be outside of your ego, outside of yourself. But there are times, I think, when we, when we get upset for the right reasons. I remember I was in college, uh, this is, I think, my first year, and I was slightly intimidated by uh, secular college because I grew up in a, in a um, Christian school. I went to Christian school from, like, uh, kindergarten all the way through when I graduated, and I went to Presbyterian school, and I felt sort of, I guess, in some ways, sheltered from the, from the rest of the world. So I went to public college, and all of a sudden there's, like, you know, my little school, my little class of 21 people, and I'm, I've, I've got 1,200 people, you know, that I'm in communication with, on a, not in communication, but, you know, I'm in, interacting with on a daily basis. And so I knew this one lady from church that I was going to at the time. Her name was Sue, and Sue was disabled. Um, she had a, a mental disability, I think, in some ways. And um, she was on her way up the stairs, and these guys were sitting down in the pit, and, and they were taunting her. And they were, they were like, she was on her way up, and they're like, Sue, Sue, you know, just like being real super mean. And just, just, just trying to annoy her, you know. And she's just, she's got her head bowed. She's just trying to get it. It's like high school, man. I'm like, come on, people, you're in college. It's like, you act like an adult, you know. No, that's not what happens, unfortunately, too many times. And so I was like, I actually was sitting there. I was reading my Bible, I know, in the, in the lobby, Christian kid. Kind of, but you know what? The God, God actually brought people to me while I was sitting there reading and asked me what I'm reading, so it was cool. And um, I was sitting there reading the scriptures, and I was just thinking about the Lord. And the Lord, as I was hearing this whole thing happening, the Lord came upon me, man. And I am not usually confrontational. Most of the time, I just kind of like, you know, let's just, let's just see if we can come to a happy conclusion. You know, we, nobody needs to get upset. Nobody needs to get angry. You know, let's just ha everybody's happy. But at, in, this, in, in this particular instance, the fire of God, man, burned up inside of me, and I got up. And I, I can't tell you, I, I've, I don't think I had ever been so bold. And I went right to those guys, and I looked right at them, I stared them right in the eye, and I said, you quit it right now. I said, you stop making fun of her. I said, you, you, need, to, you need to get your things and go somewhere else. And I went over to Sue, and I walked her up the rest of the stairs, and I got her out of that whole mess. And my heart was beating out of my chest, like, you know, when, when you just, like, you're just feeling that, 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 um, that anger, right? And in, in this case, I believe that was righteous indignation. In this case, I believe that I was feeling angry for the right reasons, that I was trying to remove injustice. I was trying to do what was right, which was to help the person who was a victim to get out of the situation that she was in. And so there are times, I believe, in our lives when we do need to stand up, we do need to be righteously indignant, for the sake of the Lord. But there's a fine line, my friends, where that line crosses from I'm defending the Lord or his honor or whoever else that I'm, that I'm trying to help and my ego and, and lifting myself up and making myself feel better because of the situation, because of my selfish desires. And most of the time when we get angry, when we get upset, we get violent, when we get angry in our, in our voices, in our, in our temper, we curse, or we say things that we wish that we hadn't said. Those things are coming from a heart of violence, a heart of selfishness. And it's rotten. And that's no place in the righteousness of God. It's got no place in the heart and in the mouths of his children. I get angry about being angry. <laughs> Look at this in Ephesians. And I rarely use other translations than the ESV because I like the way it says. But the, I love the way this says it. This is the living Bible. And I looked at a bunch of different translations to make sure it was accurate. Because sometimes when you're looking at translations, you're like, ah. I don't know about that. But this one, this is pretty good. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Get over it quickly. Look at me. Get over it quickly. It's in your best interest. It's in everybody else's best interest. Get over it quickly. 
Don't nurse a grudge. Don't hold it against somebody. Why? Because when you are angry, you give a mighty foothold to the devil. Now, if you think that because you're a believer in Jesus Christ that you are immune from the attack of the enemy and that the devil can't touch you because you belong to Jesus, you couldn't be more wrong. Because as soon as you're born again, you're given a birthmark. It's a big target. The devil is prowling around. He doesn't need to bother with the people who are already going to hell. He's going to make them feel great. The devil himself is going to give them gifts and lavish all kinds of wonderful things on them because they, they're already deceived. But for you who know the truth, the devil's going to come and attack. He's going to prowl around like a roaring lion. He's going to seek to devour. Don't give him a foothold. That's all he needs. Just give him that foothold. We were climbing rocks when we were at the creeper trail, and that's what we were looking for, these little tiny footholds so we could get up. And I'm asking Michael, I'm like, Where's, where did you, how did you do that? <laughs> he scaled the Scale the thing all the way to the top, and I'm looking for a foothold. The devil's looking for a foothold, and all he needs is a little one. And he can push himself up, and he can push himself in. 